All right. Hello and welcome everyone to the virtual public board meeting for March 3rd, 2022. And it's uh, Thursday. It is Thursday. It yes. is March 3rd on a Thursday. Not quite as good as Tuesday, the 22nd of the second month of the 2022nd oh. year. Um, that was fun. We did a, a celebration at school. The kids all had like hats with tutus on them and some of the teachers and kids wore tutus. So um, we also, you could also twin with somebody. So like a few of us staff members twinned with other staff members. So we dressed similar. So anyway, let's get going. I'll try to be quick. Um, virtual meetings, that's what we're doing. There is the information on our meetings. The code you use tonight is good for this meeting all year. There is a different link and ID for the work group and the land use committee. So make sure and check for those when you go to sign in. Mm -hmm. um, I will remind everyone this is recorded and you can sign up to um, for our newsletter to stay apprised on this. And that's really important right now because our website is currently down. We are having issues with our host and our domain. So um, Lynn and I have unfortunately been going round and round. She spent tons of time on that and I really appreciate it. So. Now it's in my court for the technical side to try and figure out what the bug is now that the other part's taken care of. So um, our, our thing, our information will be available on the website as soon as the website is back up. So if you need something super fast, let me know. And I will be posting these links in the chat when it's someone else's turn to speak. Our agenda has lots on it today, but we, um, we will get through it. Oh, I wanted to mention we will have a special guest right before our break, and then um, we'll be talking more about government, local government, right after the break. So if that's your thing, make sure and stay. We'll do quick welcomes and introductions. If you don't want to introduce yourself, you can say pass, or you can just be silent and we'll move along. Um, and I'll just call it down my screen as I see it. I'm Chelsea Powers. I'm the current chair of the Brentwood Darlington Neighborhood Association. I've been in the neighborhood about six years, not my first meeting. And I first heard about the BDNA through a national night out event that a former chair posted on Facebook. Uh, Gail, why don't you go next? I've been, it, <clears throat> been here forever. I'm Gail, she, her. Uh, been here since 1992. Uh, and we're looking forward to something in the park eventually. Oh, no, July 29th, something in the park. Mm. Great. Thanks, Gail. Uh, Stephanie, why don't you go ahead and go next? Oh, Stephanie, you're muted. You need to unmute. Thank you, Derek. Uh, I. I'm Stephanie Frederick, land use chair. Uh, I've been living in the neighborhood since April, 2017. I joined the board in May, 2017. And I did, so this is clearly not my first meeting. And um, my last meeting since I am resigning will be May of this year for a full five years. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you for all the work you've put into land use. It's been amazing. Uh, Derek, you're next on my list. Yes, uh, I'm Derek Covey, uh, he, him. Uh, I've lived in the neighborhood since 2012, not my first meeting. Um, I used to be a board member when I lived in the Richmond neighborhood. So as soon as I moved into the neighborhood, I, I thought out to find out where the neighborhood association was. Uh, anything else, I'm board member at large, neighborhood outreach. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions regarding real estate since I am a working realtor. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. And if you moved into the neighborhood and received a brochure in the mail from us, you can thank Derek for that. Yes. Let's see. Next on my list looks like Terry. You're next up. All right. Thanks. Uh, my name is Terry Pre Grigsby. I use she, her pronouns. And I don't live in your neighborhood, but I do live in your metro district, number six. And I've lived here for about uh, 25 years. And this is my first um, Brentwood Darlington Neighborhood Association meeting, although I've um, attended 
neighborhood association meetings where I live. And I heard about your neighborhood because I'm uh, reaching out to the 42 neighborhoods that are in Metro District 6 and really just trying to connect with uh, neighbors. So thank you. Thank you, Terry. We'll hear more from Terry um, about her candidacy later in this first hour. Uh, Kim Hill, you're next. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Woohoo! I unmuted successfully. Uh, my name is Kim Hill. My pronouns are she, her. I've lived in the neighborhood since 2017. Uh, this is not my first meeting, but this is my second meeting as board member. Um, I heard about BDNA uh, working with on a project with Stephanie, our land use chair, and uh, we're uh, planning ahead for circuit week. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Next on my screen is Catherine. Hi, I am. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where I am. Here I am. So I'm I'm coming because I worked on Soket Week for, for, with Trees for Life, and I'm just really curious about what else you're doing. Um, I don't live in the neighborhood. I live south, south, east, west, <laughs> west of the neighborhood. <laughs> Well, you are still welcome at our meeting. Any Thank friend you. of trees is a friend of Brentwood Darlington. All right, let's see. Um, forgive me if I pronounce your name wrong, Amparo. Oh, no, you did it perfectly. Thank you. Uh, my name is Amparo Agosto. I use she, her pronouns, and I used to live in the neighborhood up until um, 2013, but I am here on behalf of TriMet tonight. Excellent. Did I miss an email or forget something in my slideshow before I go any further so I can add it before we get there? It has been a, a rough week. So um, if I have missed something for you, let me know. Not from my end. I'm just here visiting. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> a little moment of panic there. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, how about Kim DeLeo? Hi, Kim DeLeo. I uh, have been in the neighborhood for six years and have been on the board or participating in the neighborhood association for about a year. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm a little distracted. I broke um, a, me a glass measuring cup and did not realize it would go everywhere. So busy cleaning better, glass. Better <laughs> bigger than you expect. It did. Uh -huh. Well, we're glad you're here. So go clean that up safely and we'll catch up with you when you come back for Southeast Uplift Report later. Um, let's see, Viva PDX, which I'm pretty sure has the amazing Dunya behind it. Do you want to introduce? Are you able to? All right. I know she's multitasking this evening. Um, Laura Lee, you're up next. Hi, I'm Laura Lee Cole, and I have been in the neighborhood for nine years now. Uh, she, her pronouns. I am secretary on the board uh, for this is uh, two years now, and this is not my first meeting. And I first heard about BDNA by walking by the community center in the park. Laura Lee does the thankless task of our secretary work, and we really appreciate her. So huge shout out there. Um, next on my list is Ann Blair. Hi. <clears throat> I'm, uh, let's see, I, I bought my home uh, in 2013, although I rented it to a daughter and family until 2017 when I retired and moved in myself. Uh, I did, I have uh, attended a number of meetings, uh, but not since the pandemic. It's been, uh, I've, I've never been uh, available at the time of thir Thursday evenings at this time. So I'm um, glad to, to join this evening. I think I first heard about uh, BDNA. Actually, I think my son-in-law uh, uh, told me about it having lived here, but also a brochure was left on my doorstep one day. So that's how I uh, first really uh, learned about the, the association. Thank you. 
Welcome, welcome. We're glad you can join us. Remember, you can view past meetings that we've been hosting virtually on YouTube. And I'll post those links later in the meeting when I have a moment. Our neighbor who used to help post links unfortunately moved out of the neighborhood. So I'm flying solo again and uh, don't have as many hands. So let's see, next up is Linda Goldser. Um, hello, I'm trying to start, oh, there you go. Um, I, uh, my name is Linda Goldster, go by pronouns she, her. Um, I have been uh, working at the Multnomah County Master Gardener Demonstration Garden for the last seven years. Um, I'm currently the director of that garden and um, that's all for now. <laughs> I'll talk to you all later. Thank you, Linda. Um, let's see, who have I missed here? Oh, Lynn, I don't wanna miss you. You're up next. All right, hi everybody. My name is Lynn Reck, uh, she, her pronouns. I've been in the neighborhood for 29 years. Not my first meeting. I've been treasurer now for almost four years. Um, and I first heard about the BDNA through a Facebook post. We are very, very grateful for Lynn. And um, we are also grateful for, grateful for Kim Hill, who is training to take over as treasurer because Lynn has done her due duty there and been amazing. So big shout out to Lynn. Thank you. All right, did I miss anybody that wanted to introduce themselves? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move us on to community announcements. Uh, first up on community announcements, we always hear from the Green Thumb site partners that um, attend. We have Linda here tonight from Master Gardeners. Uh, I don't have any updates from Learning Gardens Lab or from Black Futures Farm. Um, if you are interested in the grant they received, definitely check out our meeting slides or movie or movie uh, YouTube from video video from last month. There's a, a slide on that. And then I'll turn it over to Linda and go find those links for the chat. Oh, wait, no, I have to unshare my screen for that. So I'll do that when somebody else has a uh, presentation time. So go ahead, Linda, and tell us about Master Gardeners. Okay, well, as of this week, we are now open um, at the garden four days a week, Monday through Thursday from nine to noon. And anytime we are open and working there, visitors are definitely welcome to uh, walk through, stop, talk, get a tour, whatever. Um, our, we are located just on the other side of LGL property um, at about 58th and, um, excuse me, 57th, just below Duke. And um, our edible beds are being prepped now. And we just did some planting today of lettuce and peas. And um, many of our native plants are just beginning to bloom. So, uh, and yes, it's raining and we play in the mud uh, rather than in the dirt lately, but um, it's spring and we're very excited. So um, everybody, anybody stop by and visit. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Linda. I can't wait to see what starts blooming. Yes. All right, let's see. Next up, uh, Mary, I didn't see Mary from Leech Botanical. She's our neighborhood rep, but I will remind everyone that the Leech Botanical Garden plant sale through Sparrowhawk Native Plants is still going till March 15th. You can still order your plants for pickup and support Leech Botanical. And Brentwood Darlington Neighborhood Association in conjunction with some of the Learning Garden or Learning Garden Green Thumb partners will um, hopefully be hosting the pickup in the fall. So if you love native plants, you are in the right spot. Um, that was the quick blurb on that. I'm not gonna stop to read it, um, but if you wanna see it, you can grab the slideshow or the video later. This is also in last month's slideshow. A uh, quick update on schools. The only thing I ha have is Woodmere Elementary is doing a tree survey um, uh, for trees out in the big like field playground area. 
they're going to add a bunch of trees to for uh, more shade and just make it better out there. So I know they were also interested in community feedback because a lot of community members use that playground and field area after hours because it's like many of ours where it's a, a public park after hours. All right, uh, moving along, quick reminder, it's Women's History Month. So make sure you check some things out. I couldn't find any fun events to link to, unfortunately. I, so hopefully if you find something, put it in the chat. Um, let's see, the other update I have, uh, our school is sharing that this there's free tax prep for those meeting the requirements. I know getting your taxes done, especially if you have complicated taxes, can be really expensive. So Cash Organ and um, Metro Family Services is offering this free service if you meet those requirements. And that's at cashorgan.com. We'll put that in the chat in a bit. Uh, the other thing I have tonight is uh, Jacob Sherman, former board member, asked me to share this, that there's um, there's been a settlement, a class action settlement for precision cast parts affecting our neighborhood. And um, you can view the article and then you can see if you're in that eligibility zone. And it said that... Um, the settlements could average over $3,000. So wanted to make sure that neighbors had that link to check their eligibility in this class action suit. Um, a reminder that BDNA is partnering on this event coming up in April, April 5th from 5.30 to 7. We'll be uh, joining several other organizations to partner on a virtual candidate forum for Multnomah County Chair. And I'll have a graphic with logos uh, in the future, but I wanted to make sure we had something up tonight, and this is what was in the emails. Let's see. Oh, before I move any further from community announcements, I'm going to stop my share, and I'm going to let, um, let's see, uh, Amparo, you had a community announcement you wanted to share, so I'm going to go ahead and let you do that while I go find the links document. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, I am here to share this um, survey that we're sharing with um, as many folks as possible. Um, we're looking here at TriMet, we're looking to, um, to really find out from folks in the community about how um, people are feeling about riding now, uh, the transit system, um, what you would like to see in the coming months and years ahead as we get out of the pandemic. And um, we're asking about how um, people feel that we could improve um, safety and security in the transit system, um, as well as asking about our initiatives for Title VI, our limited English proficiency, and our low income fare programs. So um, we have a survey that is open through the 31st of March. And we're sharing that fine, um, far and wide because we will uh, be making some recommendations based on the feedback that we receive. And um, I am hoping to come back to you and provide those recommendations probably in the summer of this year um, because we will be taking um, further action into all of the recommendations and feedback that we get from folks living in the Tri-County area. So if you have a chance, please fill it out. And if there are other places you would like me to share it with, please send them my way. Neighbors, are there any questions for Amparo? All right, thank you so much. I see that survey link there in the chat and an email as well if you have questions. And I appreciate you being here, thanks. I appreciate the time, thank you. Give me one moment to get my screen reshared, and then Laura Lee, we're going to be approving the February minutes, so be ready. All right, Laura Lee, you're up. Thank you for moving me up in the agenda. I am not feeling well today, so we are going to. Uh, approved the February 2022 minutes. 
I received um, some corrections from Lynn on uh, the bank name title, which I have corrected. And so, and everybody else uh, said that the rest of it was fine. So I would like to uh, put a motion on the table to approve uh, the corrected February, 2022 minutes. Motion is on the table to approve the corrected February, 2022 minutes as we saw in our email. Uh, do we have a second? I'll second. I'll second. <laughs> Tandem <laughs> seconds by <laughs> Stephanie and Lynn in stereo. That was awesome. <laughs> All right, so the motion is to approve our February minutes as corrected, seconded by both Stephanie and Lynn. I can't really choose one of those. They are exactly the same. I'm going to call down the roll. Thanks, community members, for hanging while we do this quick board business. I'm I, Kim DeLeo. Aye. Stephanie. Aye. Derek. Aye. Gail. Aye. Kim Hill. Aye. Laura Lee. Aye. Lynn. Aye. All right, minutes are approved unanimous. And um, now we can get moving on the treasurer stuff. Fantastic. Thank you so much board members for rolling with that change. Um, let's see, let me grab our agenda one more. Looks like you're muted, Chelsea. Thank you, Derek. I must have hit my shortcut by accident. All right. Land use committee report from our land use chair, Stephanie Frederick, is next. So I will turn over the floor to her. OK, very fine. And I'll make it quick because we have a candidate um, speaking after me before the break. Um, so just a, a few notes. One, I wanted to reprise a special meeting of the land use committee that was held in February. Uh, this was um, uh, requested by a gentleman named Josh Roll, who's a resident of Foster Powell, but also a, a data analyst um, at ODOT. Josh's concern is um, that too many neighborhood streets are experiencing speeding that makes um, streets very unsafe for children and um, and and pedestrians and cyclists, but PBOT is very underfunded and it is focusing its efforts on the, um, on the, the high crash corridors where most of the fatalities and injuries are occurring. And that's fine, but uh, it would be nice to have some, some things that we can do on our neighborhood streets to stop the speeders or slow them down. And uh, so Josh is proposing that working with PBOT, we, meaning many neighborhood associations, um, come up with a set of strategies that PBOT would approve. We would, um, uh, and then uh, once there were this, this program of approved strategies, PBOT could make this available to residents as they raise the issue of danger on their streets. So, um, the examples of things that residents could do themselves at their own expense are um, uh, putting up uh, traffic wands that create what's called a chicane that makes a street very windy so that it's difficult for hot rodders to speed straight down the street. You gotta, um, uh, you're just forced to, to slow down and that's a low cost, you know, buy it at Home Depot type of, um, a thing that can be installed. You can get a little fancier by installing, say, horse troughs, you know, and fill them with dirt and grow pumpkins or something. But you change the shape of your street. And in doing so, you not only get pumpkins, but you get uh, slower traffic. Or you can paint bulb outs at intersection uh, corners that make, uh, again, that's visual, the kind of thing that slows down speeders who are you know, not quite sure uh, what they're turning onto or where they're, where they're penetrating there. Um, for us here in Brentwood Darlington, we have so few curbs or sidewalks or places where we, or, or even decent pavement where we can paint ball bouts on the street. But, but 
those the kinds of things can be manufactured um, again using wands and and um, uh, signs and so on. Um, so, and also there are another a, a few other things. For example, um, apparently there's a group of neighbors on Southeast Henderson Street who have who have bought big piles of wood chips and put them on the street in strategic places and then parked on the street across from the wood chips so that suddenly there's a very narrow and or several places on the street was very narrow and you got to slow down if you're going to get through and miss the car and the the parked car and the wood chips um boulders can be placed strategically along the street although that's a bit expensive um one uh, one person at our meeting suggested installing roundabouts. Um, official roundabouts are extremely expensive, but um, again, using imagination and Home Depot or Lowe's, you know, you can create your own roundabouts at intersections where um, speeders are forced to to slow down. Um, I was interested in placing stop signs at strategic locations, but I learned that Peabody feels that absent enforcement, stop signs aren't really very effective. It's just easy to breeze right through them. And if the police are not there to um, to ticket you, um, you know, you'll just do it again and again and again. So my, my stop sign suggestion was um, it kind of put at the bottom of the list. Um, um, I also like something called uh, topes. Um, this kind of comes from Mexico where, um, um, neighborhoods that aren't extremely wealthy and cannot afford uh, to install speed bumps of their own, they buy this thick marine cable and lay it across the street. And that serves very well, just anchor it on either end with a spike or some, I don't know, bag of concrete or something. And um, that's actually very uh, good at slowing people, uh, speeders, and it's not very expensive. So anyway, we, um, we, we just went down uh, an initial list or came up or discussed ideas that people came up with. Um, our next step is to see if we can find a, a street that will actually participate in a, a demonstration project that neighbors will agree to, um, to get together and, um, and do a demonstration project under the approval of PBOT and then together with uh, other demonstration projects that will occur throughout the city, we can begin the process of creating this PBOT approved program of you know, low level activist uh, strategies that can be undertaken. So my job is to go over to Henderson Street and talk to, talk to Kyle DeVille, who's Derek's, is, Derek, is, yes. is, your, is your hair cutter, right? Is your- That's right, <laughs> um, I gotta unmute myself. Now you muted yourself. Oh, you muted yourself, Derek. You were unmuted. You got to unmute yourself. There you go. Oh, there it is. He is my barber. Yes, Kyle. Oh, your barber. You. Yeah. So I'm going to go over and talk to him because that seemed like the most that the street that was the most advanced in a project that mm -hmm. that could become an official demonstration project. This is the street with the wood chips, uh, which is an idea I just love. You know giant piles of wood chips. So in any case, it's going to be an ongoing uh, project. And um, uh, so we'll, we'll give you more updates later. But right now, we're at a process of trying to get some demonstration project, a demonstration project going in Brentwood Darlington. And Josh is working on the same thing in some other neighborhoods. Yeah. It's a very interesting project, local activism, uh, community building. It's a, it's a great idea. Uh, Okay, quickly on to something else. Uh, this has to do with trees. Um, a, a group of people who belong to the Brent Stock Incubators. And if you'll recall, this is a, a, a group of residents that live mostly over um, uh, west of 45th Avenue who are working on clearing um, the uh, right of way alongside unimproved streets and planting, putting in trails, putting in benches, uh, bulletin boards, whatever, um, creating a very inviting space along streets. So a group of, of these people um, would like to start or are going to start um, some monthly tree walks. You know, they're, they're calling themselves the tree team and um, they wanna focus on learning about trees. 
They're going to have monthly tree walks. The first one is starting April 21st. And I'll make sure that I advertise the, um, the time and the place where residents are invited to come meet up and start the walk. And the idea is to stroll through the neighborhood, learn the identity of the street trees. Those are the ones that are park, uh, parked, are uh, planted uh, adjacent to the street and not in private yards. And um, uh, we'll be learning how to identify um, certain invasive trees, um, particularly tree of heaven, which I, I learned from um, Johnny uh, Lutold, who's the head of this tree team project, is, is, is massively present in Brentwood Darlington. And uh, I hadn't realized that. And so this was uh, you know, news to me, but so we'll be learning how to recognize trees for life, um, black walnut and sumac, and we'll have speakers who, who accompany us and help us um, understand what, what the trees are and how to identify them and so on. And then in the fall, um, we'll have a, a particular uh, Tree of Heaven inventory campaign where we really zero in on these uh, tree, trees of heaven that, are, um, that spread so quickly and, and make life miserable for a lot of gardeners. Um, so uh, we'll, um, we'll keep you uh, posted as to the monthly walks. And then as I turn land use over to the new land use people, then they will keep you posted as well. But this sounds like a lot of fun. It's a way to meet people and learn about the neighborhood and, and, and learn to see what's right, right in front of you. But if you don't understand it, you don't, you don't see it. I, I now realize I've been looking at a lot of trees of heaven and I didn't know that I was. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I do because now, because of this group now, Johnny Leuteld uh, uh, shared some photographs with me and showed me where to go to find trees of heaven. And oh my gosh, um, yeah, they're everywhere. Um, so anyway, I'm encouraging everybody to join in on this. It's gonna be a lot of fun. So we'll keep you posted. Uh, then I was going to bring up the precision cast parts, uh, but um, uh, Chelsea has already done that. That's kind of exciting. It's been a long time coming. Um, the, uh, and as she said, that uh, residents may receive as much as $3,500 a piece. We'll see what, what's left after the attorneys um, take their, their share. Um, uh, a part of the settlement though, has already um, been paid by precision cast parts in the form of installing um, air monitoring equipment and air pollution controls at their plant. Um, so whatever is um, left over from the, the money that they've spent then is, is part of this total um, $22.5 million settlement that, that was reached with precision cast parts. So if, um, if you were here in 2016 and you're under the plume, then you're eligible to, for um, recompense. I came a year too late, 2017 is too late. The person I bought it from, the house from, her uh, notice came in my mail and I forwarded it to her and, um, and told her she's in line for money, but I am not. Um, so that's a, a interesting, yeah, there is a, a cutoff time. Um, and then finally, uh, just real fast, um, we got an email in the uh, Brentwood Darlington Land Use um, email uh, inbox from the Lentz Neighborhood Livability Association. They're calling on many other neighborhoods, or they're, they're calling on neighborhood associations to come together to, to focus on safety and live and livability, it says we are an organization focused on safety and liability, but I think li they meant livability in our fair city. Um, they would like to uh, try to, to advocate to the city council in an organized uh, fashion to improve safety and livability. So that's something I can um, uh, forward, um, or take up with Chelsea and, and, uh, and see, and she can bring it up on a future agenda to see whether the group is interested in participating. Stephanie, in would you say the name of the group again? My sound glitched out for a moment. 
it's the it's it's the Lentz Neighborhood Livability Association. So it's not the Neighborhood Association. Yeah, we've worked with them on the past. Um, they uh, volunteered with us when we hosted the candidate event in 2018. I want to say. So we we've um, we've partnered with them before on on uh, some events. Okay. The um, all right. Well, so their email is in the um, in the BDNA uh, land use. I'll just I'll forward it to um, to you. But, but you have access there too, so you can look at it. Just one last thing, very fast. At the last meeting, I brought up the Harney Park name uh, question, and I said I I don't myself have time to work on it, but I just want to make sure. Um, the, for some of you, at least, it would seem like an important thing to address. I just want to bring it up to let you not forget about it because you you found it important. So uh, I think you wanted to write a letter to Parks or to the City Council um, asking that the name be changed. Um, so I'll, I'm just uh, handing it off to you again uh, because you thought it was important. And I will stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Stephanie. For those who aren't aware of the Harney Park name issue, a neighbor uh, message just asking if Harney Park is named after, I believe it was a general who um, is not a great guy. We'll just put it that way, which is a very mild way of saying he was awful and terrible and many things. So, um, but we don't know and haven't had, we don't have the capacity to research it. So if that project is super important to you, which it is important to know and to be able to change these names. But um, if that speaks to you and you'd like to look into that, let us know. We will happily help you do it and send you the original message from the neighbor. All right, now I'm going to um, go ahead and share my screen again, because uh, Terry has some slides and let me see if it will do it properly. Give me one second. It's grumpy. I'm also happy to screen share if that would be easier for you, Chelsea. Uh, let me try this. And if it doesn't work, then we're going to do that. Nope. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make you uh, co-host real fast. And you can go ahead and share. And that way you can also control your slides the way you like it. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay. There you go. Thanks everyone for hanging with us while we work through all the technical pieces of meetings that used to be us covered over, you know, laptops going, oh no, it won't connect to the projector. <laughs> so, okay. all right, go ahead, Terry. And um, thanks for being here. I'll hand it over. Right. Well, it's really nice to be here tonight. And um, I appreciate all of your neighborhood updates because some of them are really relevant um, in my uh, neighborhood as well. And um, was really excited to hear about the uh, Multnomah, um, ma the garden, uh, the demonstration garden. I am director and chair of the West Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District, and we host the master gardeners in our space um, back when we used to um, go to offices <laughs> and um, indoor uh, workspaces. And so um, really great to hear about that project. And I also want to say um, thank you to Ampara. I, work with a hockey community organization and um, we serve East African immigrants and refugees. And we've done a fair amount with TriMet and most of our community members are low income and um, with English as a second language. So I'll be following up with you to make sure that we get that um, survey out to our community members. So thanks so much. And um, I am Terry Pre Grigsby and I'm running for Metro. District 6. As I said earlier, I've um, lived in District 6 for about 25 years, and I moved to this uh, area, sight unseen, from the East Coast, and I thought, you know, I would just see what the Pacific Northwest was all about, and I fell in love with the um, city and with the surrounding areas, and it was clean. I could afford an apartment in a safe neighborhood. Um, I was able to get a good job. Uh, later, when uh, my husband and I, we met and we um, bought a home together and we started a family. So it's been a really great place to live. And um, what I'm seeing today is really disappointing to me. So this is Newell Creek Canyon. 
and it's owned by Metro. And I am uh, committed to taking the necessary actions as our next counselor to make our Tri-County area safe and welcoming again. You know, we see the, the trash in so many of our um, neighborhoods and our sidewalks and our natural areas, and it's really unsafe. And it's really a humanitarian crisis that we have so many people living out on the street. So I'm prepared to tackle these difficult issues to um, make our area more livable and safe again. And so how do we get there? Um, I think we need to focus on a healthy environment, government accountability and transparency, and also taking care of our community. I am a disability advocate as someone who lives with a mobility disability. And so I have lived experience with what it's like to navigate our infrastructure. And um, I, I am connected with other experts and advocates and want to build on that to make all of our public spaces accessible to everyone. So, uh, you know, our environmental crisis really requires urgent action, and I have the skills and abilities to address that. So I have been a local environmental leader for about 20 years as executive director of the Trine Creek Watershed Council, um, elected director and chair of the West Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District. And the problems that I see that we really need to address are trash accumulation, greenhouse gas emissions impacting our most vulnerable communities and also those urban heat islands that are literally killing our humans and wildlife. So I've worked for a long time um, with um, Friends of Trees and other organizations to plant more trees and I know that we can do more and we can do better. <clears throat> I think it's really important that we know where our public dollars are going and that we hold our governments accountable. So I was a senior performance auditor under Secretaries of State Bill Bradbury and Kate Brown. And I know I'm aging myself a little bit by saying that, but I have many years of experience um, looking, uh, analyzing public budgets and um, really understanding how to I um, drill down to where our money is going, how it's being spent, and to use best practices to identify solutions to ensure that our public funds are being used well. And I think that's really important. Metro has a lot of money. You know, they've collected um, money through taxes, bonds, and levies, and they've promised to us that they will deliver new housing, new affordable housing, housing services, um, improvements to our transportation systems, regional garbage and recycling services, and of course, natural areas and parks. And I don't think that they're delivering on their promise to us. And I think that we can do better. So I will bring my account um, auditing skills to the table and hold Metro and its partner jurisdictions accountable for delivering on their promises. And lastly, we need to take care of our community. And as I mentioned, I um, live with a mobility disability and I already work with disability advocates and colleagues to make sure that when we are planning for future infrastructure, which really is what Metro does, um, it's a large planning agency that uh, is an umbrella over the three counties, that um, we are looking to the future for um, new infrastructure that's centered on accessibility for everyone, regardless of age. And <clears throat> homelessness, Crime and trash is really hurting everyone, and we need to address those, but also, um, as I said, make sure that new projects are centered on accessibility for everyone, because 75% of Oregonians will experience temporary or permanent disability, and that could include vision or hearing um, or um, neurodiversity. So I think that we need to uh, make sure that as elected leaders, we are taking 75% of our 75% um, of our community into uh, account when we're making our decisions. And also many members of our vulnerable populations, including immigrants and refugees, which I mentioned I, earlier that I work with, um, have disabilities and other needs that must be met. And Metro can be a leader for that. And I, I don't know if you can hear that in the background. There's something kind of like a home with that.
Sorry about that. Um, and I'll just finish up here. And I appreciate uh, the time that you've given me today. So I just want to win in May for a better future. And there's, um, I'm proud to have endorsements from over 40 community uh, leaders representing environmental, labor, auditing, LGBTQ, affordable housing, food insecurity, immigrant and refugee disability and aging communities. I also have several elected leaders who are supporting me from uh, the cities of Portland, Beaverton and Tualatin, as well as Multnomah, Washington and Clackamas counties and several state representatives. And, and that's important because while um, I hope to be able to represent district six, we know that um, our Metro counselors make decisions that impact everyone within the tri-county area. And um, I have worked with nonprofits and different government agencies um, during my tenure, both at the state of Oregon and also as a nonprofit leader to get projects done on the ground. So I have the experience to make sure that we can get those projects done on the ground to support our neighborhoods, to make them safe and livable, and also to support our local economy. And uh, a couple of things, if you're interested, I'd love to hear from you. You can visit my website, terryformetro.com. You can host a yard sign if you're interested in that or a volunteer. And I just wanna say thank you for the opportunity to introduce myself tonight. And uh, sorry about that, um, the noise in the background. I am a parent and I have a family here. And when we're all working at home, um, things happen on Zoom calls. So anyways, I'm happy to answer any questions or I can just give time back to you for your meeting. So thank you so much. Neighbors, do you have any questions for our guest? Uh, Stephanie, go ahead. You have your hand up. Oh, yes. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. It's much appreciated. Um, how do you think you can get Metro to do the things that you're interested in doing? I mean, what's the best way to, to work with the council? Yeah, that's a good question. And so uh, I think that, um, that it's time for Metro to uh, make sure that it's really listening to the community but also um, identifying specific measurable results that it wants to achieve with a timeline and then um, identify you know, which partners they need to work with to get, to get those um, things accomplished. And there are, you know, um, we were talking about transportation earlier and I really appreciated um, the um, sort of entrepreneurial spirit of your neighborhood and the neighbors there looking at solutions for improving streets, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, where I live in, I live in Southwest Portland and we have a lot of unpaved roads and a lot of streets without sidewalks. And as uh, a neighborhood um, leader and you know, advocate for almost 25 years now, you know, we've tried so hard to implement projects to slow down the speeds, to make it safer for pedestrians and bicyclists. And, um, you know, we have good ideas, but we keep getting pushback from local government agencies like, like PBOT. So I was really happy to hear that, um, uh, you know, that PBOT is willing to entertain some ideas. It might, it might be willing. It might be, but, you know, I think that that's what we need in our government leadership yeah. is um, people who are willing to um, listen to the neighbors to listen to those really good ideas mm -hmm. and to then um, respect those ideas and um, support neighbors in, in implementing projects like that. And I see Gail has her hand up and, and she uh, asked about sanitation I, services. <laughs> yes. And um, yeah, go ahead sanitation. and call on folks as you want to. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, I know Metro has really, yes. yeah. Um, so Metro is really, I, you know, I, I believe Metro has failed us with their um, trash programs. So they are responsible for something called the RID Patrol, RID, 
and uh, that and they are tasked with picking up trash from public spaces. And I met with counselors during the pandemic and and learned that they put some of uh, most of their um, trash pickup program on hold during the pandemic. And I understand that they were balancing the needs of frontline workers during a global pandemic, which is a really tricky thing. Um, but at the same time, uh, we continue to see trash piling up in our neighborhoods and um, you know, impacting the livability and safety of our neighborhoods as well as our local businesses. So as Metro Counselor, I would increase the RIT Patrol program significantly. I think that there is opportunity for the um, transfer stations to expand their capacity. And I would also um, consider suggestions that I've heard from neighbors, for example, to have more sharps containers um, in neighborhoods to where people can safely dispose of needles. And um, you know, that's just one suggestion I heard yesterday from a neighbor who has a lot of, um, who sees needles frequently in their local park and along sidewalks. And I think that there are solutions that can be put in place in the near term to address um, our you know, trash crisis. Uh, Chelsea? I just wanted, since you were talking about trash and Metro services, maybe um, should you be elected, uh, you could put in a plug to get our bulk waste events back. Uh, oh, neighbors would absolutely. love to help with the trash problem, but Metro canceled the program that used to let us have a bulk waste event every May and take, you know, thousands of pounds of trash that neighbors, they can't get rid of it or just going to have to put out on the curb and hope nobody sees them. It's, um, it's really a problem, you know, and our, um, we're seeing the same thing in my neighborhood and our surrounding neighborhoods, you know. It's expensive and difficult to get to the trash, uh, to the to the transfer stations, right? So if you have items at home that are too large to fit into your, um, you know, I don't know if you have a receptacle that gets picked up once a month or every two weeks, um, you know, if you have something really large, what do you do with it? It's, you know, I personally with a mobility disability am not able to get large items to the transfer stations and those cost money as well. And so when we when we were able to host those um, neighborhood bulk waste events, they were really popular and we were able to um, get the trash um, out of our homes. And also what I've learned is that a lot of the, um, the trash that we see in public spaces really it belongs to uh, individuals who are um, you know, illegally dumping large items. So it's not, um, it's really not all coming from the homeless, which is uh, sort of a misnomer and um, kind of yeah. maybe vilifies the homeless in a way that may not be um, uh, fair. There are a lot of people doing illegal dumping and that could be significantly reduced by um, increasing those bulk waste events and increasing the RID patrol. Stephanie, and I know I have like one more minute, so um, that's true. Oh, the uh, don't oh, have well, one. But one of, the, one of the reasons that um, that the Metro canceled these, uh, its support of these, these collection events was that neighborhood associations were using them for fundraisers. And Chelsea can speak to this in a much more articulate way than I can. But when we did our um, cleanups, we had people who were so grateful to pay $20 to bring their stuff a few, a few blocks. And then we have used that money to uh, buy uh, grocery um, uh, debit cards for people who are facing food scarcity. And it's not as though we are uh, wasting this money in any way, it's gone to a very good cause. And Chelsea, maybe you can speak to that better than I can, go ahead. Yeah, we used to, um, it was our, pretty much our only fundraiser. Um, and it was our uh -huh. most attended neighborhood event. And we didn't turn anybody away. So um, we were told by Southeast Uplift that Metro wanted neighborhood associations to look at it as a public service. And so we had a suggested donation, but if somebody showed up without money or they had 
way more stuff than they, you know, could afford to dump. We just dumped it. We covered it. We, we waved it. It didn't matter. It was, you're here. You want to dump your stuff? You know what? Somebody else paid the full fee. It's a donation. And some people donated more than the, the asked donation. But the, just anecdotally, the amount of illegally dumped mattresses and couches has gone way up since we stopped doing those events mm -hmm. because where else can you dump a mattress for five bucks? Correct. Yeah. It's expensive and it's difficult to get mm -hmm. all the way to the transfer station. And, and we had, um, we had coordinated the, the year they canceled them. We had coordinated with some local neighbors to offer hauling services for neighbors who have mobility issues for our senior neighbors to mm -hmm. pick up ahead of time and mm -hmm. bring it to the event for them. Cause we have a few neighbors with trucks, some that work in sanitation services themselves. And they were like, yeah, we'd be happy to. And, you know, they would just donate their time as part of the event. So it, there are ways to make it a public service where it's, you know, any fundraising that happens, hey, that's great. But they they didn't have to cancel the whole program to make that a non-issue because the truth is, is most neighborhood associations weren't making a profit over on it. Maybe right. 10 years ago, we made five grand, something like that, I guess. Mm -hmm. But because the hauling fees were covered, Metro covered way more. And it was that reimbursement that we mm -hmm. got. And it was, you know, months later, and that's been slowly pulling back and pulling back mm -hmm. and pulling back. Mm -hmm. And had we not gotten reimbursed the small amount we did the last time we did a bulk waste event, we would have been in the hole like two grand, but we, but yeah. it was such a needed service. So anyway, I'm rambling on and I, I know I'm, I'm uh, preaching to the choir here that we need bulk waste events because we all miss them. So uh, mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and stop now. No, I really appreciate that. And I think that, you know, that goes back to what Stephanie was talking about earlier in her presentation about neighbors coming up with solutions for their neighborhoods. You know, we know what we need in our neighborhoods and we need leaders that are willing um, to listen to what we have to say and then to implement some of those um, ideas. And I've gone like two minutes over and I promised Chelsea, I wouldn't take too much time. You're so I okay. Just, I actually went us over. You had stopped talking before eight. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I really appreciate your time tonight. And um, Amparo, I wrote down your email. I'd love to um, connect with you uh, regarding um, the work I'm doing now with immigrants and refugees here in Southwest. Uh, we have one of the largest uh, populations here of East African immigrants and refugees because it's the largest mosque in the area. And um, so that's, I'll follow up with Amparo and I really appreciate everyone. And um, you can see more information if you're interested at terryformetro.com. And um, I hope to hear from you if you'd like to follow up. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. All right, we're going to take a five minute break um, and I'm going to pause the recording. So this is the time to refill your water, um, go check on your dogs, whatever you need to do. If you don't need to do anything, feel free to chat amongst yourself. So, so I will uh, pause the recording and I'll see you back here. We'll be back here at 8.08. Okay, there we are. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I wanted to have a better slide for this prepared, but I'm sorry, my day was incredibly rough at work and I ended up having to stay late to write a behavior report. So um, I just wanna give a heads up that the, uh, there's been a, con there's a congressional redistricting for our neighborhood and we are no longer going to be in um, Congressman Blumenauer's district. And so um, check out the, Ah, pardon, sorry. Um, ask Google what district we're going to be in because I did not have time, but I do know that we are changing districts. I believe it might be Jamie, but um, I don't know. So I'm not going to lead you astray with false information that I haven't verified. Know that we are being redistricted and it is changing and hopefully I will have better information for you at our next meeting. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to the rest of our committee reports and other updates. 
Uh, starting with our treasurer's report. Go ahead, Lynn. Okay. All right. So we started off the month with $5,900. Um, we had, we received our communications fund from Southeast Uplift for this year, $500. So that puts us at $6,400. Um, with upcoming expenses and other reimbursements, we're going to end up with uh, $5,113. So any questions? There was not a lot of activity this month. Any questions for Lynn on the treasurer's report? I, uh, so we have a dividend at 26 cents. Is that right? Yeah, that's just the, the Advantage Credit Union. Um, at the end of the month, they it's usually about 25, 26 cents. But okay. are you... I usually pick up the report like on a weekend. So I never, you know, I sometimes can't do it at the end of the month. So this is just what was from January. Okay, from the one month, okay. Yeah, it's usually about 25 cents a month. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you, Lynn. Really so appreciate it. And um, let uh, Kim and myself know when you're ready to do that bank stuff that we got to do. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Kim DeLeo, do we have a Southeast Uplift report today or are we on our off month between meetings? Hi. Well, we are uh, at the in-between. I have a meeting on the 7th, but I can give a couple of updates. Uh, let me get to my notes. We did do a training session uh, for new board members that was on the 23rd and a gentleman named David Allen came and went over um, all of the laws um, regarding, you know, um, being on the board uh, as it pertains to Southeast Uplift. So that, that was really helpful. Uh, the meeting prior on the 7th, um, there were, um, Leah Fisher resigned. That was the big news. So she's no longer with Southeast Uplift. And um, so I, I think that, you know, they're going to be looking to replace her. So that was kind of the big news. And then I'll have another update at the next meeting. Hopefully we'll be back on track. Um, they did approve uh, grants and I have the totals here. Let me just go to my notes. Um, so $52,000 uh, roughly in small grants and $10,000 for the DEIA grants um for the applications and there's uh more specifically on their website you can see the breakdown for those but that's all i have looks like kim hill has a question go ahead uh, kim yep here i come kim delio a uh, quick question um, we submitted a grant to Southeast Uplift, uh, to cover our, um, intern and, uh, I received an email saying that they might have additional funds, mm -hmm. uh, any word on that, if they were able to cover all of the grants or if they're just doing a portion of those. I know that they were not able to cover all, but let me, I can ask. Do you know uh, what was the name on the grant or that that was? Uh, I heard it was uh, the person was Paula. Let me uh, check my emails real quick and then uh, I'll uh, put it in the chat. Okay. Yep. Because I can ask in the next meeting for sure. I'm making my notes. Thanks. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, you have a question? Uh, yes. I just wanted to mention that uh, Matcha Williams is taking over. Leah um, Fisher's responsibilities oh. where land use uh, and transportation are concerned. And they just held their first meeting and uh, apparently went very well. Excellent. Matt, she's a great person to take that over. All right, any other questions on Southeast Uplift? All right, let's keep moving on. Wait, I, I, wait, 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 wait. I, I just have one more. Go ahead. What is the staffing situation there? Is it all staffed up or, and how's the new executive director doing and so on? I think she's uh, doing really well. Um, I know that she's walked into quite a bit, you know. Um, she gave us a breakdown. 
you know, about, you know, her first four months on board, you know, she lost Leo. There was at the time no land use meeting. We did lose another board member, um, person of color. Um, she's been working on policies, procedures, kind of nonstop and handling uh, public record requests and grievances from Allen Field. So yeah. she's been very busy, but I think she's doing really well and moving forward. And she seems very knowledgeable and so we'll see. But, um, you know, I, I definitely know she's trying to guide us out of this period of, you know, kind of um, turmoil, you know, that, that the board has been in which has kind of been that way since I started. But uh, I think it's gonna start moving forward. Um, Alan Field was voted by his neighborhood association uh, to be on the board. So he's not been um, you know, kind of sworn in yet. So we'll see what happens with that. So are there any staff vacancies at Southeast Uppers? I'll double check, um, but I would imagine uh, you know, somebody's probably got to take over Leah's position. Well, what? Okay, so Matt just taken at least part of that. Mm -hmm. So I'll find, I'll ask for some clarification okay. and have that for you. And I can email you too, because the meeting's on the 7th. Yeah, okay, good. So I can email you and Kim, you know, after our meeting on the 7th. So we don't have to wait that long. Oh, okay, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, Kim, thanks for following up on all that stuff. I know it's uh, kind of been a brutal entry for that new executive <laughs> director, but we appreciate you uh, being our eyes and ears there and keeping us in the know. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, Gail, it is your turn. We get to talk about a summer free for all. Woo, woo. Yay. Since I had two Fridays last month and no Thursdays. <laughs> We decided on a concert. Yes. Did you see the email I included you on? Right. And it, it said concert. It did say concert. Okay. That's what neighbors said they wanted this year because they are the same price this year. It is. It is. Yes. It is. So that's that's why we put out a survey is it is the same price, only a thousand bucks, which is the new normal price and no longer four thousand for a concert. Yeah. And I think we might be able to get a discount uh, for being a neighborhood with so much money. I, I mean, no money. <laughs> um, we do need to pick a band. It's July 29th. We have our day. Um, it's, it's up to you guys. What do you want? Well, I think, isn't Jed gonna send us some choices when we get a little closer? That's what his email said. Here, let yeah. me let me stop sharing and go see. Um, I wonder if he forgot to include you on that, Gail. What? Or, yeah. let's see. It's uh, happened. Yeah, so I, I sent him the results of the survey, right. which were um, neighbors overwhelmingly were interested in a concert okay. and, um, um, sorry, can't talk and type at the same time. Um, they wanted a concert and um, neighbors were most interested in something like, uh, there was the most kind of request for jazz or blues, something diverse and bluegrass or country. Uh, something danceable was a specific request. And I think that would go over well with a lot of neighbors. Uh, and then yeah, Jed, Jed did include you, Gail. I wonder if your email ate it. I know mine's been really bad about that lately. Huh. Um, he said he put us down for a concert and stay tuned for next steps when they have more stuff for us. Right. Um, okay. okay. So yeah, I think he's going to get back to us with band choices. Isn't that how that normally works? Okay. Okay. Maybe let's follow up with him. <laughs> Do you want to follow up with him and say, hey, do we got to find a band? Or are you going to send us choices? <laughs> She's being funny, right? Yeah. Do, you want to, do you guys want to play? Yeah, of course we do. We play it every year. Okay. Because he's like, Marsh Rovers are available. <laughs> I know, but we got neighbors that 
ask for something different this year. So we got to give more chances. Okay. All right. But that doesn't mean we can't have a Mars Rover concert. Yeah. I mean, we have lots of parks. We have sound equipment. Oh, we have a PA. I mean, yeah. How much fun would it be to have a Mars Rovers concert in Hazeltine Park? That would be awesome. Uh, and we could do that uh, around like National Night Out time and yeah, just make it a big like picnic and, picnic and concert. We've done picnic in Hazeltine. Yeah. Hot dogs. So, so yeah, like pencil that in and we'll figure out details later. Okay. We're so, good. Yeah. I, I think two concerts is better than one. So let's, right. let's put the park on the hook for one and then we'll throw our own party. Okay. <laughs> cool. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> let's see. I've lost where I am in the schedule now. All right. Um, Derek, RMLS report. Let me pull up your documents. Um, which are, of course, going to be cranky because nothing in my life is easy today. Um, actually, Derek, do you want to share from your screen? I'll just make you a co-host. You're muted, Derek. OK, I'm unmuted. Are you able to share from your screen, or you want me to fight with my PDF viewer for a second? Um, up, 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 up. I yeah, just make sure I have the right thing. I can okay. share. Hold Let's on. Let's try We're... sharing the screen here. Okay, you are now a co-host, and you have to say, "Yeah, I'm a co-host." All right, gotcha. yeah, I'm cool with that. And then, um, then you should be able to share it. Gotcha. Where do I go to share it? Um, do it's look? down at the bottom on mine. There's a green button that says "Share Screen." Share and then screen. You click Ooh, on that, that and dangerous. you can choose whatever it is you're trying to share. From there we the... go. Got and it. I'll go there. Woo! Okay. We see can screen you... share. All right. Thanks, Derek. Great. So you Thank can you for see making that. my life easier. There you go. Well, hey, I just learned something new too. Um, yeah. So basically, I did a um, earlier this morning. I just did a quick search over our neighborhood, and some things should be. If they they might be a little outside the boundary, but basically they're inside the grid of our neighborhood. Um, this one here, just to share with you, is active listings, and so you see the properties, the dates on the market. I'm actually researching this a little bit because as I show you the sale pendings and solds, these have been on the market, you know, this is 45 days, 27 days. The pendings and solds are typically four and five days. And so I never assume, but part of what I do is find out why things aren't selling. And that's what I'm in the process with these. Um, I will go so these are just active listings, but if I go here, let's see here if I can do this correctly. Are you seeing the screen that says pendings? Did that change? It did change. We see okay. the one at the top says 23 matches. Okay, great, terrific. So you can see quite a few properties in here. Our board member, uh, Rob, um, he actually listed his property um, in the middle of last month. And it closed, I believe, on the 25th of last month uh, for cash. He's in the solds. So it's interesting. When usually uh, pending will be like 30 to 45 days. But if something's selling for cash, it could close in two weeks. So, um, But anyway, as far as the pendings, this is what I'm seeing as far as the median days on the market at the bottom. or It's like DOM, CDOM. And CDOM, if you're curious, is cumulative days of market. So if something goes on and off the market, it doesn't reset the clock. It just adds a days to whenever it was last in the market. And so median is five, average is 26, 27, which tells me that the middle, you know, basically somewhere in the middle, it's five days or less. But if the average is skewing the 26, 37, there may be, what I'm finding is, in a market like this is very hot, it's easy for sellers and or their agents to overprice a listing and have to do price reductions. So we're seeing a little bit of that where people are getting ahead of the market. But then all in all, uh, most sellers, especially people that have sold before, uh, people that are, have experience and of course their agents, uh, they're pricing things correctly or at market. And you're seeing them on the market just for four or five days typically multiple offers. And um, 
you know, and then of course things are getting bid up from the list price. Um, I will, any questions or? Any um, questions for Derek? You can no pressure. Ahead. No, I'm just, it's interesting that, you know, I, I, I see there are two uh, under the sold, uh, or no, under the pendings yes. on Alden Street, that's my street. And I'm, you know, I'm just, um, I'm aware of all this change occurring in our neighborhood and right. uh, and part of what you're I mean what you're you're presenting you know shows mm -hmm. shows that change we're change where people are buying houses who are not maybe who, who are bringing I don't know a, a change to the neighborhood I think right and what I'm finding among the buyers just to share with you mm -hmm. um, I don't want to you know, like um, I have a neighbor, someone's talked to me. I know he's making, working for one tech company. He's making, I want to say 125,000 a year. And um, he now is working for Facebook, AKA, what's their new name? Meta. 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 Yeah. yeah. So he's working for Meta now and he's making 200,000. And God bless him. He gets to work from home. Uh. Um, and so... <laughs> But anyway, when you see that happening, you know, then he can, that's what's kind of driving our market. So, um, and of course, uh, everybody, you know, there's still like the, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I've, I rented not too long ago before I bought in the neighborhood. I rented for five years uh -huh. and my landlord is you know, a former um, John L. Scott agent. He's now retired. And I was talking to him yesterday about Upper Hawthorne, like this, 7-Eleven being closed in the Starbucks. I don't know if you've been over to Hawthorne lately. No. And we were just thinking, you know, man, the prices aren't slowing down and the rents aren't slowing down either. Everything's going up, but we're seeing a lot more kind of big city problems like you'd think San Francisco or Seattle would have. You know, they're shutting down a, a 7-Eleven for no other reason I can that I believe other than, you know, uh, loss, shrinkage shoplifting right there's too much stuff there's no reason to shut down a 7-eleven so um i just tell people it's like i'm just i keep my eyes open and my ears open and um and if i shut up and just listen i learn a lot <laughs> okay but if people are buying properties who work for meta and earning yeah. two thousand dollars a year yeah they're, they're not shoplifting no no but my point is there's a lot of poverty there's a lot like for example the even the rental market i heard some statistic where with the homeless houseless that about maybe somewhere between a quarter and a third have minimum wage jobs or some type of employment oh, I, okay, excuse me i understand now where yeah. you're going i, I beg your pardon uh, derek i understand yeah. So okay. they're going, there's two yeah. things happening at the same yeah. time right yeah 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 and of course uh for me it's like you know I, there's no judgment I just want to try to figure out, it's interesting, all this is going on at the same time. So it's really, it's really, you know, quite interesting. One it thing I'll cut to, yeah. it is, it's fascinating. And, and just when you think you've seen it all, it's like, wow, this is, you know, when we went into the recession in 2008 in this market here, um, that I learned a lot of new things, foreclosures, short sales, how to do those successfully and help people. And now I'm uh, looking at this market wondering, I'm just kind of like just taking it all in. I, uh, I'm seeing stuff I haven't seen before. And I've been practicing real estate for quite some time. Oh, I don't, okay. I'm not, not going to gauge, give myself away here. But um, in this last page, can you see the solds? where it says yes. 18 matches. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you're seeing again, if we look at the bottom, the stats, they've got like average list price, average sale price. So this is where things are selling above list price. Uh, 315 was the average list price per square foot. 330 was average square foot. The sold, right? The final sold price. Again, four days on the market, which means uh, for example, when I listed something north of here in the Woodstock neighborhood earlier, our last year, it was on the market four or five days, but we listed Thursday morning, but we didn't review offers until Sunday night. And then I told all the agents um, and of course their buyers that you know we weren't going to review offers until the next day, Monday. And then I would be calling on any pre-approval letters to make sure that the lenders had actually pre-approved the buyers. 
and also find out how strong they were, but also I'd verify any proof of funds for the cash offers. Um, and uh, but so basically multiple offers, but that's why you see this four or five days. It's typically, it's been listed. We're giving people four or five days and we have an offer review date. I know with Rob's price, um, or Rob's property there in Flavel, I think it's here somewhere. Where is it? It's like- uh, sort of in fourth... the, A little above the middle, 79, 79, Southeast Flavel. Yeah, 5610. Oh, 5610, yeah, okay. Yeah, wherever that is, right there. It's just so, over the middle. Yeah. yeah, and so that was listed for 399, um, 990. And of course it sold for cash, but it, it got, it sold for 453. So that's like, let's do the math. That's what more than $50,000. And I was surprised, nothing, no judgment about Rob's house, but I believe he had it rented and it wasn't like it was turnkey. There was, you know yeah. what I mean? It was, it was yeah. worn and it could use some paint and so on. Right. It had a great floor plan, nice backyard, uh, but man, it, it needed some touch up. But in this market and probably at the advice of, uh, his listing agent, who actually was the one that helped them buy it, Tom Ramsey with John L. Scott. I think Tom just probably told him, look, Rob, you don't need to do anything in this market. <laughs> just, just we have so little inventory, you don't need to bother painting anything. Just Wake put it on the market. The yeah. And I see, I see wait, I see Gail has her hand up and then sure, I have Gail. Yeah. Do you have any idea how much the units on 70th and Duke sold for? There were uh, four tiny houses and then I think three attached townhouses. I'd be happy to research that um, and find that out. Now- They weren't I, for sale very long. They, were they attached, Gail, or? People moved in almost immediately. Yeah, it was 70th and Duke, right? Because yeah. I know there's a couple of places I went out and previewed. There was one unit that was on the market forever. It was a smaller unit. But these, I think, had attached walls. And these are the ones at 70th. The ones so let on Duke yeah. attached, and the ones on 70th mm -hmm. behind them are four little tiny houses, but they're detached. Right. But, you know, go, and I'm happy to research that. I've looked at so much stuff, my, it kind of blurs on me, but I'm happy to check into that. But what yeah. surprises me is, as you see Rob's house, nothing wrong with Rob, but you got to remember his house or his property, but he, Flavel's kind of a busy street, right? Back in the it's day, you would discount for that. It's a bus line, right? Yeah. Um, but that didn't seem to do anything to slow... <laughs> You right. know. And, okay, so that raises the, the question that I that I have. Um, yes. Given the gun violence, the trash, the homelessness, the, right. the, the syringes, yeah. uh, the flailing city council, and mm -hmm. so on, how come people are buying houses here? I just don't get it. Well, <laughs> it's a good point. It's um, it's I guess it's counterintuitive, but I think this is my take on it, Stephanie. There's a lot of people coming from other places on the West Coast and other big cities where, you know, they, they've seen things that are worse, quite frankly. I and see. so when they, so Portland still, even though things are kind of crazy, it's gotten crazier in the bigger cities, right? I mean, you've seen Walgreens or a number of places just shut down multiple stores, right? <laughs> and so even with our problems, I guess they're not as big as the big cities. And even I've noticed things like, um, where was I? I was at Woodstock Safeway. And, you know, they've always closed that one door, the, the yeah. I think the Southern door. Right. And then at one point I couldn't find a red basket with a black handle because I didn't want a cart. <laughs> and I, I go to one of the guy, one of the people there, the employees, and it's like, where did all your little baskets go? And he's thinking, well, we think a bunch of people just took them. And like they, they go shop. You know, they they buy stuff in the and then they walk out the door with it, you know, without buying anything, right? <laughs> and so that's where a lot of supposedly those little red baskets went with the black handle. And I actually, it's funny, I, I don't know what why timing or what, but I was at the Safeway on Powell and Cesar Chavez, and I was shopping and I saw somebody, I wasn't really paying attention, but a gentleman walked out the door and he had a basket full of groceries, the red basket. And a store employee ran after him and said, hey, do you want to come back here and pay for that? 
And the guy just turned around and said, he mumbled something and he kept walking. And of course the store employee, he didn't chase him. He just went back in the store. So, um, so Derek, I'm going to, I'm going to pause you there. So we don't get sure. too far off track on our agenda. And sure. I also see that Kim Hill has a question. Sure. Um, and in the chat, there's some comments there. Um, I think complex issue is definitely the, uh, the thing there are many factors. So go ahead, Kim, ask your question. Sure. I, I just want to say that to reiterate that this is a really complex issue and there are many factors. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, it it's really unfair to blame these issues on one segment of the population. There has been a, a really um, a lot of unemployment. Uh, the, the pandemic has been really hard on some of our houseless neighbors. And um, I think that it, it you know, perhaps as a group, maybe we should ask a, a houseless group to come and talk to us about some of the factors that contribute to these causes and ways that we as neighbors can be um, compassionate. And um, I, I just, I really think that that's important. And, um, you know, I will say bleeding heart liberal, but I also do have experience working with houseless folks and, and uh, you know, there are many factors and I, I don't think it's fair to bring in just one group and say that they were responsible for all the changes, et cetera, in our neighborhood. Just a comment. Sure. Okay, so yeah. I, I would like to amplify what Kim is saying that we could also have an economist come in and talk about the larger economic forces that have resulted in uh, people being on the street. And uh, because right. there, there are yeah. systemic things happening. And part of it is we don't have enough housing. Oregon is the worst state in the whole union as far as supplying enough housing for people. We're, we, are, we are 50th. Right. And, um, yeah. uh, so, you know, that's part of the problem as well, but also having no, no livable rate wages. You know, that's changing now a tiny bit, but, and then we have the, um, the drug issue, we've got fentanyl pouring into our cities. And, and this, we've never had to deal with that before. So a whole bunch yeah. of things going on. So I would- so It sounds it, like yeah. maybe we wanna have some guest speakers coming in the yes. few months. Yeah. Um, if you send me ideas for folks to invite, I'm happy to do that. I know mm -hmm. we've had uh, transition projects come speak with us in the past. Um, we have a, a, a neighbor who works for them. so. I'm sure they'd be interested in coming to talk with us. And if you have an economist that you would like to recommend, like it would be great to learn more about these issues. And then we can, you know, we can't do much. We're a small volunteer board and we all are very much at capacity, but we can figure out how to use what resources we have, like we've done with our grocery outlet cards. That's, you guys don't know how many times that's helped neighbors. Neighbors either reach out because they need it themselves or neighbors will reach out because they know neighbors in need who are feeling, you know, not able to ask themselves. So just giving food is a big deal and it's something we can do. So maybe having yeah. some guest speakers would let us find some um, accessible things like that, where we have some things on hand where we can try to make a difference and help uh, neighbors be informed and, yeah, so send me send me ideas for folks to invite or um, board members feel free to invite people if you know them and uh, let me know so I can make sure they're on an agenda with time. Sure. Do you need some more cards or for grocery outlet or? Um, we're okay on it for okay. now. I think we have about half left at my last count of okay. our last buy. Um, okay. We recently gave out one to a... Um, a struggling family with several kids and mm -hmm. um, another one to um, new to the neighborhood or new um, newly out on their own. That's what it's newly out on their own teens, um, older mm -hmm. teens, like, you know, 1920s uh, in their, their first place who were struggling with food security. So um, right. we're helping kind of all, all around. So if you know yeah. somebody who is struggling with food scarcity, remember BDNA has $50 gift cards for our local grocery outlet. And we give those out whenever anybody needs them. So you can request those by 
um, emailing us or uh, catching up with one of us, however else you can. And um, Gail mentioned there's a free food pantry on Flavel. Uh, yeah, shout out to neighbor Winnie who runs that. It's between 60th and 62nd. She is amazing. Um, she gets food all the time. She's been giving away food for years. And I think she also sometimes has a little clothing closet out there, all sorts of fun stuff. So definitely stop by and say hi to Winnie um, mm -hmm. and see what she's got. Um, okay, well, I'm rambling off topic. So Derek, do you have anything else on a, our, our housing report here? Not really, other than just to, there's it's just there's all kinds of things going on. And I'm thinking, as I talk to other people in the city of Portland, especially on the east side, you know, whatever you think about what's going on in our neighborhood, it seems like sometimes things are a little tougher in other parts of the city. So that's why people are still moving here and buying, so. They just know it's the best neighborhood in Portland. <laughs> There you go. We got the best neighbors, obviously. There you go. <laughs> all right. So, all right, Derek. So when you're done, go ahead and unshare your screen. Okay. I will and do that. Um, let's see. Uh, our last topic is Soak It Week. And unless you really want to see our, our regular plain old graphic that we've been using, we don't have to share. Um, and then it makes it a lot easier for me to see everybody. So, Kim Hill, do you want to update on Soak It Week at all? Um, you know, I don't really have much of anything at the moment. I think we're kind of, let's see, we are in a, um, a holding pattern until we receive confirmation from the nice uh, Trees for Life folks that um, we um, have received our grant for our buckets. Um, we uh, have talked about collaboration. Uh, we did set our dates, and I believe those are June 11th and 18th. So those would be Saturday events again. Um, we have conversations, I believe, in the works with the nice folks at the, um, the Moose Lodge. Is that right, Chelsea? So, um, you know, potentially hosting one or both events at the Moose Lodge. And that's a really nice space because it has a parking lot and it's, it's visible from 52nd Avenue, which is a really busy area. And it's also, um, what are the other factors? They, uh, they have other folks who would like to help. Um, I and think that part of um, the, the partnership more partnership building we're working on with the Moose Lodge in general, um, trying to tie events together to um, bring more awareness of both organizations and how they can help neighbors and how neighbors can get involved. Yeah, the, the one item that I did uh, work on was reaching out to the um, City Bureau of um, Trees, uh, <laughs> <laughs> environmental urban forestry that could be the one yes it is late the <laughs> nice nice urban forestry folks and the tree steward folks and i i think it might be a really interesting thing if we could have someone come and table um you know there is uh that uh thing that lorelei and uh, laura lee and i identified last time last year with um Brentwood Darlington having one heritage tree in our entire neighborhood. And so, you know, potentially finding ways to identify the, the special trees in our neighborhood, especially if those are on private property and saving those, um, you know, that's a definite like a long-term uh, wish and, and dream list. But I think, you know, advocacy, education, connecting with our neighbors, um, another, um, this is just putting something else out there. Uh, another thing that I think would be wonderful is if we can find ways for us to um, connect our uh, 
our neighbors who speak other languages uh, with our materials. So any thoughts that you have on groups that we can connect with directly, let them know that our events are happening um, would be so great. So I really uh, would uh, love to have that. I mean, we we do have all our materials uh, translated into into languages, and the city will help us do more if that if there if there is an interest. So um, you know, I'm th I I would love input on groups that we can connect with proactively and and include those into our um into our our messaging and our invitation to participate in our events that's a really great idea kim we can at, at the very least if we can't find some direct contacts we can send um uh information to the kind of the big groups like apano and erco and I'm, I know I'm missing many, many of them, but uh, and letting them know that we'll be having this event and the materials in these languages will be available. So please encourage your your um, your friends and neighbors and family to come get blue buckets. And maybe we could have the city help trans with translating maybe a press release or a message into the languages that match our cards, so that we could send a press release in that language saying, hey, here's this event and we will have information in your in this same language that the press release is in. Great idea, Chelsea. I love it. Oh, and because always take the city up on translation if we can. Yeah. <laughs> the more we translate, because you can recycle a lot. Um, okay, anything else on Soak It Week? Any questions? I'm excited. I'm hoping to snag myself one more bucket this year so I don't have to keep running back and forth between my buckets. <laughs> okay. Um, let me check. Is there anything else tonight? Do we have anything else anyone wants to talk about? Any other announcements, discussion points? Because we are we're at the end of our agenda. Right. Yeah, I don't have anything, Chelsea. Okay. Yeah. All right. How about we give ourselves the gift of ending almost 15 minutes early? Okay. Have a That's great good. March. Good happy Thursday. Yeah. Great. And uh, happy uh, tomorrow. Happy Saturday Eve. So have a great yes. night, everyone.